This morning, I'm going to preach a dangerous sermon. The Reverend William Barber says that a dangerous sermon is one which challenges our notions of religion and its place in society. A sermon is dangerous, you see, if it challenges the status quo, if it enters into the realms of despair and hope, of death and of life. Not every sermon is dangerous and not every sermon needs to be. Sermons vary in purpose, right? Some teach, some uplift, some comfort. But I think that pastors should preach dangerous sermons on occasion. They should do so as a matter of integrity, a matter of following the gospel, a matter of responsibility to God and to congregation. Dangerous sermons, they're needed in moments like this, right? In Kairos moments of history. So I'm gonna preach a dangerous sermon today and we're going to hear dangerous sermons all month long. Our sermon theme for July, as many of you already know, if you've seen our Facebook page or website, our theme is American Idols. So through this theme, we're going to explore idolatry in American culture and in American Christianity. And this is a dangerous theme, even more so because I'm introducing it on 4th of July weekend, a weekend where we celebrate America. But we have to remember, even on this weekend, maybe especially on this weekend, that the America created on July 4th, 244 years ago, was not for everybody. The freedom offered on that day was not offered equally and equitably to all people on this land. And it's not offered equally and equitably today. I think as Christians in the United States, we're called to live in tension. Many of us, including myself, honor family and friends who have served this country. Many of us, including myself, love the beauty and diversity of this nation. If you take a road trip, which I've done from coast to coast, you will see that this land holds so much diversity. And yet, many of us, myself included, are also troubled, deeply troubled by the inequality we see on a daily basis. And we know that this country is not yet one which lives up to its ideals. So we cannot, we cannot as Christians be complacent about the idols that are present in every aspect of American culture, including American Christianity these idols that harm our relationship with God. In the book of Romans, Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Paul, I feel you. Anyone else? Has anyone else been there? Does anyone else know what it's like when your actions don't quite match your values? We want to do what is right, but time and time again, we fall short. But Paul, of course, isn't just talking about those mistakes, as painful as they may be. Paul is talking about something deeper, more long lasting, more troubling. He's talking about sin. Paul understood sin as a distortion of relationship. For Paul, sin isn't merely talking behind someone's back or being rude to your parents, although those are not necessarily good things and deserve to be examined. It isn't just an individual act, it's the distortion, the perversion of relationship with God. And in this passage, Paul says that that sin has taken up residence within his body. It dwells within him. Why does Paul say that? Why would Paul the apostle let us in on something that sounds like a pretty deep secret? And how does Paul even know that sin is dwelling within him? 
Well, let's take a minute and remember Paul's life story. Paul wasn't always Paul. He used to be Saul. And Saul hunted down the earliest Christians. Saul watched and approved of stoning these believers. Saul was a zealous and bloody persecutor. So Paul, oh yeah, he knows sin. Sin twisted his love for the Jewish tradition. It twisted his love for his people into persecution of those who did not worship and believe like him. And Paul, oh, Paul, he knows idolatry. He knows what it is to worship something other than the God of love and equity and justice for all people. Now, Christians often read the story of Paul and they see themselves in the place of the persecuted. After all, Saul was persecuting Christians, right? But the truth is that Christians have also been and often been in the position of persecuting. From the Crusades to colonialism and the justification of slavery, Christians have for centuries been in the position also of the bloody persecutor, at least in this country. Just as sin twisted Saul, sin has twisted America. It has taken up residence in this land through the idol of white supremacy. White supremacy has touched every aspect of this country. There's a lot of conversation right now about how white supremacy is embedded in politics or government institutions, economic systems, culture, but it is also alive in American Christianity. I'm not making an original point here. This is not a revelation that I have come to. Many people have come to this conclusion before me. At the end of his autobiography, Frederick Douglass wrote, what I have said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slave-holding religion of this land, and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to accept the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial, and hypocritical Christianity of this land. That's the idol of white supremacy. White supremacy has distorted and continues to distort our relationship with God. How do I know? Because I've experienced it. I was well into my adolescent years, maybe even early adult years before I realized that there are no white people in the Bible. There are no white people in the Bible, not one. I was so used to seeing white Jesus, white disciples, white Abraham and Sarah and Mary and Joseph, that it didn't even occur to me that that might not be true. And when I first saw images of Jesus as a person of color, Jesus as he actually was, a Middle Eastern Jewish man, it felt radical to me. The truth, it felt radical. The idol of white supremacy, the sin of white supremacy dwells in the bones of this country. It has misshapen my own theological growth. I had to unlearn a lot of things. I am still unlearning a lot of things. And the idol of white supremacy has twisted the moral imagination of America. And what is moral imagination? Moral imagination is the capacity to imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world, yet capable of giving birth to that which does not yet exist. I want to say that one more time because this is so important. Moral imagination is the capacity to imagine something rooted in the challenges of the real world 
and yet capable of giving birth to that which does not yet exist. Moral imagination took the slaves out of Egypt. Moral imagination brought the Magi to the cradle of an infant king. Moral imagination told the disciples to fish for something other than food. Moral imagination fueled the likes of Martin Luther King Jr. and Frederick Douglass and Dorothy Day. Moral imagination is how we build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. But our moral imagination is sick. Dr. Frank A. Thomas, a black professor and theologian writes that the moral imagination of America is dominated by the idolatrous and diabolical imagination. What has and will always hinder the moral imagination of America is white supremacy that reserves the rights and benefits of America only to a few. Wretched person that I am, writes Paul, and we join Paul in this cry because we can see that our moral imagination is sick. We can see that the idol of white supremacy dwells in this land and has twisted our relationships with one another, with ourselves, and with God. Wretched people that we are, but, but have hope. It's wretched, but have hope, because recognizing the problem, that's the first necessary step. Idols can't help but be revealed. Idols eventually show themselves for what they are. There's moments, there's always moments where they can be seen and recognized. Think about it. Saul had a blinding moment on the way to Damascus that revealed the idol of persecution. Moses told the Israelites that they must tear down the golden calf literally tearing down an idol that separated them from worshiping the God of their covenant. Ruby Bridges marched into a school and revealed the idol of segregation and white supremacy. Idols always show themselves for what they are. And in the past few months, the idol of white supremacy has once again shown us that it continues to hold firm in the United States of America. We see it, we see the idol of white supremacy when politicians use Nazi symbols in their campaigns and retweet chants of white power. We see the idol of white supremacy when there has yet to be justice for Breonna Taylor. We see the idol of white supremacy when we see yet more names of black trans people being murdered. We see the idol of white supremacy when we read about the wealth gap between black and white America. The idolatry is clear. If you didn't see it before, you see it now. The moral imagination of America is twisted. We must disentangle the Christianity of white supremacy from the Christianity of Christ. We must do that. But we can't do it by ourselves because our moral imagination is sick. The tools we have to imagine a new world are stunted by this idolatry. So again, we cry with all wretched people that we are, who will rescue us from this body of death that is white supremacy in America? But, but again, have hope because Paul provides the answer to that question in the next verse. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We can't do it ourselves. We can't save ourselves. But the good news is we don't have to, right? We have Jesus, the real Jesus, not the white supremacist Jesus. We have the real Jesus, the man who preached dangerous sermons and lived and ate with all people and was killed for it, but rose again. We have Jesus Christ. We need that grace of Jesus Christ because it reinvigorates our moral imagination. It heals our distorted relationships. Jesus shows us a way to be human outside of the idol of white supremacy, outside of idolatry. Because where white supremacy says to follow empire,
where Jesus was killed by the empire and then rose again to show that he defeated it, where white supremacy says that we should put brown and indigenous children in cages at the border, Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Where white supremacy says that white people deserve all the wealth, Jesus says it is easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Where white supremacy says we can't possibly have health care for everyone, we can't possibly take care of everyone, Jesus healed lepers. Where white supremacy says let's build more prisons in this country than any other country in the world, Jesus says I'm going to set the captives free. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. For Jesus who said, beloved, beloved ones, let me show you a different way. It doesn't have to be like this. The way of Jesus is not easy. It's not easy to tear down idols, literal and spiritual. It's not easy. But it is better than white supremacy. I promise you that. It is not easy. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we can do it. We can bring this idol down. We can get free. Jesus showed us the way. A way where all are welcome. A way that we will recognize and remember now through communion. Communion which gives our spirits the fuel it needs to follow Jesus now and on.